racist thoughts and words and deeds, how to repair, how to change assumptions, how to make it right. We don't know how to talk to our neighbors who think every episode is just an episode again and again and again. We don't know how to live with COVID-19. We don't know how to live with COVID-16-19. But this much we do know. We know that Christ walks this road of pain before us. We know that Christ overturned tables to demand institutional change. We know that Christ gave clinking metal to Caesar, but life itself belongs to God. We know that crucifixion is death by suffocation, that the cross is where Jesus couldn't breathe. We know that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love you make known in Jesus Christ. We know that when a seed falls into the ground and dies, it gives rise to new life, that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. And we know that where the breath of the Lord is, there is life. Be our breath. Be our life today. Amen. There are others who are waiting to come in, so we will wait just a few moments to um, let others in. At this time, we will, at this time, we will um, observe eight minutes and 46 seconds of silence. Um, as we observe this eight minutes and 46 seconds of time, silence, this is an amount of time that Officer De Derek Chauvin had his knee in the neck of Mr. George Floyd. And during this time of silence, we ask if you have a candle that you light it now or bring it into this um, session, into this sacred time. And let us reflect on where we are as a society. Let us reflect upon where we want to go as a people as we bring our lighted candles into this space.
Our conversation tonight is grounded in love. And it's also grounded in justice and the need for justice, because what we believe is that without justice, there will be no peace. There'll be no peace in the soul. And there'll be no peace for the ancestors. So what we'll be framing in this conversation is two questions. In order to experience and to understand Black Lives Matter and to understand the experiences of Black Americans and the community and the disproportionate impact of racism on our community, we're going to begin the first question um, for members of the Black community, for members of the community who identify as Black or of African descent, African Americans. And we want those who identify as Black or African American to have an opportunity to respond to the question first. We will then open up the conversation for those who not, do not identify as Black or African American. Now, while this structure and or the speaker's words may seem uncomfortable, I am asking that those who are present with us today sit in the tension, sit in the discomfort, sit in the uncomfortable, and resist the urge to defend anything. Because ultimately, we are about change and we are about love and people need to be heard. So we have a prompting screen and we have a way in which you can speak. Um, if you will look at the bottom of the tin, if you can show them where it is. So if you'll look on your toolbar where it says participants, if you click your participant bar, there's an opportunity for you to raise your hand and if you want to speak, we, we, there's too many people on here for you to go like this. We won't acknowledge you if you do like this because we won't be able to catch everyone. But if you raise your hand in the toolbar, we will do our best to make sure that we hear everyone who desires to speak. We also ask that you keep your comments to two to three minutes. Um, and if you are starting to run over that three minute mark, we have a screen for you for that. I'll let you see it. <laughs> there it is. It will be bright and bold before you. <laughs> and we ask that you begin to wrap up and close up your statements because we want to allow as many people to speak as possible. So the first question, and it is directed to the black community because now is your voice time. What has been the personal impact, physical, psychological, spiritual, of racism and racial violence in your life? And you may raise your hand if you would like to speak. We're going to call on Dr. Kim Smith out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Is he here? Oh, okay. Okay, can you, okay, good. Um... What was the question again? <laughs> what has been the personal impact of racism or racial violence in your life? Uh, it's been emotional. It's been psychological. Um, I've had several incidents that have, I guess you would call it post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, being, um, almost lost, lost my life to a policeman um, about 25 years ago. 
and I cannot get it out of my mind. Every time I see a policeman, I go through this traumatic experience that gives me a moment. I don't care who it is. If I see one coming down the highway, if I see one crossing the street, if I see one driving by me, it, it's, it's a huge, um, it's something that's going to live with me the rest of my life. That's it in a nutshell. Um, I see the hand of Carol Neely. Okay. <clears throat> Racism, um, <clears throat> it's an integrated part of my life. Uh, so much to the extent that I uh, rarely question it. Uh, in thinking about this question, I've, I've graduated from uh, top tier universities with super, superb grades and I've traveled the world and I've had a successful career in corporate America. So for that, honestly, racism is so ingrained in my mental psyche that I had to think about what I would do differently if racism were not an integrated part of my everyday life. Um, <clears throat> for example, our work emails have a personal icon, and most of my non-African looking colleagues have a picture of themselves on their icon. I don't. I want the recipient of my email to read my work product before they know that I'm African American. I know how to be non-threatening, whether it's how I respond to an officer during my so often experienced random airport security checks, or if I'm pulled over while driving. I dress up when I travel for pleasure. I uh, chuckle <laughs> at the privilege when I see someone wearing flip-flops and shorts when they travel through the airport. I don't think twice about calling the taxi on behalf of my brother so that it's not rejected. I don't allow my five-year-old son to wear his hoodie on his head even though he really likes the way it feels. And if you think about it, the African-American Black community, it's not a monolith. The community, it's diverse in its experiences, families, education, religions, and perspective. Yet I feel responsible for my entire race. Uh, when a newscaster reports that someone does something terrible, I pray that they are not Black. I tip more so that Blacks will receive better service in restaurants. I do these things and more without thought. So when I think about what's been the physical, psychological, and spiritual impact of racism in my life, I would not be who I am today without racism in my life. Um, living while Black, it's real and it's tiring. Um, Kamal, Reverend Kamal Hassan. Thank you, Carol. Really. So, so thank you, um, Reverend Shinetta. I, I want to mention a few incidents in my young life that had to do with uh, police departments and the National Guard. So, I grew up in uh, Southern California in Los Angeles, South Los Angeles, um, lived there all my life until uh, we relocated to the Bay Area in 99 and I went to seminary and we continue to live there still. But I do vividly remember the time of the Watts Rebellion in 1965, which was actually touched off by police violence against uh, uh, a young man and his mother, um, but I was eight years old uh, the year that happened. But I, but I vividly remember seeing uh, bayoneted, rifle-holding National Guard troops standing post in my neighborhood and watching as uh, jeeps with uh, machine guns mounted on the back of them uh, patrolled our streets. Uh, 
the first uh, encounter I can really remember with police happened when I was about 12 years old. I uh, pretended to be ill one day. Uh, I don't know why I didn't want to go to school, but I, my mom allowed me to stay home. She didn't believe I was really sick, but whatever her reasons, she let me stay. But at a certain part of the day, she sent me to the store to, to buy some things for dinner that night. And uh, I lived in an area um, on Vermont Avenue near uh, Florence. And so I could walk this long alleyway uh, off of Vermont Avenue to get to the Ralphs there that was at uh, Vermont and Florence. And I decided to not walk on the sidewalks because it was, I could be seen you know, during school hours, not at school. So when I was a couple of blocks away from actually getting to the store, I noticed that there was an engine noise behind me that was slowly following. Uh, and, and my parents never had the talk with me about what to do if the police stopped you, but somehow in my bones, I knew there was two things I should not do uh, if it happened to be that it was a police car behind me. I should not stop and quickly turn around and face them because that would be a provocation and some kind of admission that I was doing something wrong. I also, under no circumstances, should run because I knew even then I could lose my life. And so what I did do was step aside so that the car could pass and kind of look out of the corner of my eye to see what this car was. And lo and behold, it was a police car. Uh, and it didn't pass me when I made way for it. It just kept going slow behind me until uh, the car pulled up even with me. There was an officer driving and then there was one in the passenger seat who told me to stop and I did. And he asked me my name and I told him what my name was. And he asked me, why was I not in school? And I said, I was sick this day and said, well, if you're sick, why are you out here on the street? And I said, well, my mother sent me to the store to buy some things to bring for dinner. And then he began to curse me. And I looked down, his arms were folded and in his hand pointed towards me was a pistol. And he said, if we come back and out around and see you out here, we're gonna take your black ass to jail. Uh, and I froze with the verbal and with seeing the gun. And then they drove off. So I went on, I went to the store. This time I did walk on the sidewalk because I didn't want to be walking down the alley if I saw them again. But that left an, that left an imprint on me. You know, this, this police, the way he dealt with me as a middle schooler, because I happened to be not in school, my life was in danger. And um, yeah, that's how the police be in the black community. Okay, um, thank you, Kamal. Uh, Lauren Glenn. Hi, so, um... For me, I think the people who've gone before um, have kind of summed up a similar experience for me. So I would just sum it up to say that um, racism and racial violence have impacted me by number one, reducing who I am, having to reduce who I am, whether it be in work and the way I dress and the way I talk when, when, when in white company. And that is something that Black people, at least me, you learn it. When you're when you're growing up, um, it's not. Uh, it's kind of something that's just a part of it. It's kind of subtle too. You know, people may see, basically they're telling you that you know who you are is not enough to be able to feed your family, to be successful, to do what you want to do. So constantly, always having to reduce yourself, um, and then similar to what Carol said, uh, what that does it it you feel like when you see other black people, that goes into the second part is respectability politics. Racism calls black, causes black people and me to participate in respectability politics because you think that, um, well, I have these degrees, I am proper, I do this, I speak well, I don't speak slang, I don't code switch, so you should treat me right. And these other people, they're embarrassing me. 
when really racism is the problem, the system is the problem, the, the people aren't the issue. So it causes you to internal, me and everyone to internalize the racism so that you start blaming other victims of racism uh, for why a white person will do things like, oh, well, this is why they do this to us. This is why they kill us. This is why they do this because we weren't respectable enough. And so I think in some ways, I'm always trying to attack that. It happens all the time. I don't wanna make it seem like it's anybody's fault of why racism exists, one individual person always trying to attack the system and always not trying to find a reason to prove why I deserve to exist. I don't want to say Black Lives Matter means Black Lives Matter too. Like, I, I shouldn't have to say that. You sh you, we've been doing that for four or five years. So when Black people feel they have to say it, that's the respectability politics because you want the white people not to feel bad. So for me, racism has caused me to always think about what white people feel and do so they won't hurt me. Um, but things like this help me always to remember that, you know, I know who I am. I know what kind of God I serve and I deserve to be here because God saw fit for me to be here. Thank you, Lauren. Karen Blanding, um, out of South Carolina. I have three sons and long before um, they ever entered school, we used to, we had the conversation about um, the fact that they were black and that they were male, um, that they had to do three times as much, present themselves, you know, um, more what I can, with what the world would consider respectable and, you know, just do things different just because um, it would be assumed that they were not worthy. And, um, and of course, um, in some respects, when people would speak to us about our children and being mannerable and things like that, I, I think they felt that it was a compliment. But to me, I took it as what, how did you expect for them to act? You know, you're saying this to me as if my children are exceptions to the rule when that's not necessarily so. And I try to sh teach them that that is the way the world is. Um, there's an assumption about them simply simply because they are black and male. And then of course, when they, they have always been in mixed company, um, but I try to um, always instill in them to be proud of who they were and un unapologetically black. And so we, um, and of course, as they got older and they got ready to drive, we had to have the talk um, because they would automatically be presumed as angry black men. And of course, my husband is six foot two and 320 pounds. And, you know, he's been stopped for, you know, he likes to drive. I mean, he puts his foot in the tank. And so um, always afraid that you know when because he's gotten stopped before and always afraid that if they ever ask him to get out the car that i automatically know that they're going to be intimidated by his size they don't know who he is they don't know his heart they don't know anything about him but he would be perceived as a threat simply because he's six foot two and 320 pounds <laughs> so so even though, you know, we've been, I'm going to say lucky, blessed, covered, that we have not had um, direct experiences, um, they are not exempt from our life. They, it has affected friends of ours and, um, and people in our life. And, and it shouldn't be assumed. I just wish that the world could allow us to show them who we are. And instead of us having to prove <laughs> who we are, if that makes sense. It makes sense. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, Michelle Mears. Um, I grew up in California and um, and in some ways felt somewhat shielded um, 
by the perception of, of others. Although I've had my fair share of experiences in California. I think it wasn't until I went off to college at Fisk University where I was confronted with overt racism to walk down the street and have two men in their car yell out at the top of their lungs, hey nigger honey. And I felt the sting of those words. As I was brought up, I grew up in a household where we were always reminded that black is beautiful, but often confronting the reality of others questioning or suggesting that black is not beautiful, that black is ugly, that black is evil, that black is bad, that black is violent, whether that was portrayed on TV, whether it was in the news about someone who had done something and always referencing a black person. As a woman, as a black woman, having to navigate the gazes, having to deal with people who suggest that my natural hairstyle is not beautiful or appropriate or professional for people to put their hands in my hair, to treat me in a way that feels like, to feel as if I were someone's slave, that you could touch me without permission. Those are the degrading experiences. Those are the experiences that get internalized. Those are the things that our parents had to contend with to remind us that we are beautifully and wonderfully made. To have to hear the talk from my brother, to know that he had been pulled over plenty of times. For both of us to hear, now when you go to the store, make sure you, your items are put in a bag so people don't think that you take, you've taken from the store. To be told that you should dress up when you go shopping so that people know that you have money. These are the things that, these are the things that we face oftentimes on a daily. If no one says anything to us specifically like, what are you? It's still internalized. So as we walk out the door, we walk out with the reality of who we are, trying to muster up all of the strength and the wherewithal and clarity that we have a right to be ourselves and to not be judged. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Reggie, good join. Okay. Um, I'm the oldest of three boys. Uh, I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, for me, I'm just grateful that my parents took the time to share with me the do's and the don'ts. If I were ever approached or were, was in a situation where I needed to explain myself, uh, if needed. Uh, I grew up watching uh, events take place where I couldn't attend due to my skin color. Uh, there were there is a park that's still there in Greenville uh, at this particular time, uh, growing up as a, as a child. They had a swimming pool there that I would love to just go to just see sometimes, just the beauty of the, the water and 
not necessarily knowing what was behind the reason why I could not get in and I could see others swimming who didn't look like me. Uh, also being warned several times uh, in stores that we could go to, that there were only certain areas where I was allowed. Uh, even as I, uh, I remember vividly playing with a, a little white boy in the store and uh, we walked over to the water fountain after he proceeded to fit, drink his water uh, uh, as he finished and i walked over i was immediately told that i could not do that and just taking those experiences as i grew up uh, i knew that there was something different uh, something that I had to always be on guard for, uh, never knowing when, where, and what may happen. But similar to Kamal, I knew that um, there was an inner that just told me I should not, or I should, whenever necessary. Um, as Kim spoke earlier, I cannot count the number of times driving from Orangeburg, South Carolina to Greenville, South Carolina. And in between there is the capital, Columbia. Uh, numerous times uh, I would be flagged over, pulled over, um, explained to me just a routine check, checking for um, license plates that were not dated, or uh, what have you, but knowing not to get out, not to make any quick movements. Uh, these are things that I, it be, for me, it became routine. And honestly, it's still routine for me to this day. Um, just recently, well, before before the pandemic, there I'll just back up. There are times even uh, since we've moved to California that um, leaving the sanctuary where where New Hope worships, there are times that I've been approached by officers um, because someone called. There's a black man coming out of the church. Um, it looks like he's carrying something. I'm not sure what it is. I'm not making this up because this is what the officer told me once we actually had the time to speak and talk. And he said, you know, I guess he realized that I was not a threat. I was able to show proof of what I had, where I was coming from. And I guess I took a risk um, I did reach in my pocket slowly to pull out um, a card that stated my name and that I was director of music at New Hope. And I shared with him that I, on Saturdays, we have service there. If he's not doing anything, I would love for him to come. On either the second or third call, I noticed the slender officer uh, that walked up to me. He looked at me squarely. I looked at him squarely. And he sort of tilted his head to the side and he said, your face seems familiar. I said, yes, yours too. And I said, I forget your name at the moment, but I think you were here once before on a similar call. And he just lowered his head and said, listen, you know, I'm, I'm just doing my job. I said, hey, I understand, I do. And you're keeping the church protected and you're looking out for us. I thank you for that. And we proceeded to have a conversation about other things. But most recently during this pandemic, uh, I think maybe two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, my wife 
was experiencing a headache and not feeling well. And I was asked to go to the drugstore to try to get something to help soothe this headache. I um, decided to go to this Rite Aid. And as I parked and approached the Rite Aid, there were folks coming out. Uh, the store I thought was actually closed. But as I saw a group of three exiting, I said, oh, they're open. So I walked in and um, as I got close enough to the door, this tall, heavy set guy uh, approached the door. He said, can I help you? I said, yes, are you closed? He said, no, we're open. I said, thanks, I need to uh, get an item out. He looked, I looked at him and I walked on in. But as I noticed, as I walked down the aisle, a gentleman came from the back and stood. The gentleman that I spoke to at the door was just walking through casually. So again, this is also familiar. It's not the first and I know it probably won't be the last. But as has been said earlier, and it just sort of echoes, just having to be on guard, um, always on watch, for sure. And I think that was my cue. <laughs> I think maybe so. Um, I think we have two more people, as I can tell. Thank you, Reggie. And that is Rashawn Johnson, and then we'll have Shelby Brown. Yes. Um, growing up in um, the Mid Southwest and understanding uh, racism from parents who grew up in the Deep South. I have a unique perspective on being able to experience the different subtleties of racism as you move throughout the nation. I have seen uh, the Jim Crow version. I have seen the uh, buckle of the Bible Belt version. I have seen the uh, subtle uh, Northeastern New England version of, of racism in the form of uh, tolerance and not acceptance. Being a black woman in corporate America at the executive level has taught me that in all things that I do, I have to understand my place. Mm. And the challenge in that for me is that the spirit of my ancestors will not allow that. The spirit of the people that raised me will not allow that. There is a certain authenticity that we as black people are not only rightfully owed, but are now understanding that we must embrace about ourselves when it comes to systemic racism, subtle racism, and one term that I haven't heard lately, innate racism. I work with people every day who don't look like me that innately behave a certain way because they don't know any other way to behave. They're not self-aware enough to understand and allow themselves to be in a place of vulnerability because that attacks their superiority. When I was coming up, 
as a young girl and being told that I was really pretty for a black girl. Mm-hmm. Being told that, oh, you're so tall. Are you going to play basketball? Which I did. Or being told, you know what, Rashawn, you can't come into every meeting with your, like you've got fists up because I'm five foot 10 and over 250 pounds. And because I'm passionate about my work and I'm passionate about my job and I'm passionate about doing the right thing. When you hear that throughout your life, you tend to question whether or not you can actually find within yourself the space to feel safe enough to say to yourself, no matter what they say, no matter what they do, I am still worth it. I'm worth it because God gave me purpose, because he has a plan for me, because he has put people in my path that I impact on a daily basis from the strength of my ancestors and from the spirit of the holy God almighty that is within me. I am told daily there is a light that shines through me. I am told often, we don't know what it is about you, but there's just something odd about you. And so when I read my Bible and God says that that his children are peculiar, we as black Americans are peculiar, but God made us that way. And we should not have to diminish ourselves in order for someone else to feel superior or validated. Um, thank you, Rashawn. Okay, so we have Shelby Brown, and then Joyce Norwood will be the last person, I believe. Shelby. Well, I've been listening to all of you uh, speak about how you're feeling. And it, I just noticed I'm probably old enough to be all of you. You, I'm old enough to be your mother. And um, I thank God right now that I grew up in the 50s and 60s. I, my first encounter remembering about segregation was when I was about eight years old. Uh, in, I grew up in Portsmouth, Virginia, and we had to ride the bus to get downtown, uh, and we had to go to the back. But I had this teacher who was my kindergarten teacher. She said, Shelby, pretend that you can't read, and therefore you can stand in the front of the bus, and the bus driver will tell you where to get off. So that's what I did for years. I pretended that I couldn't read so that the bus driver would tell me where to get off. I would say, I'd like like to get off on Dinwiddie Street, please. I knew where Dinwiddie Street was, but I did not want to go to the back of the bus. So that's what I did. And in the 50s, I remember vividly sitting in at Woolworths when I went to Hampton Institute. I would, I sat there and I sat there for 15 minutes at a time. But I can tell you for one thing, we were taught how to act. Our ministers, our parents told us what not to do, what to do. We could not respond to any police officer. And that's what I did. But then I said, you know, I don't want to live that way. So I moved to New York and I can truly say, I have always been one to, I guess you would call it fight the system. I am um, 
growing up in Virginia made me confident. So even now to this day, after retiring from Orange County, I can truly say that uh, I used to speak my mind and I know the consequences and I have, I have been given the consequences, but I do speak out and I just ask these young people, don't stand back, you can speak out. Uh, and I just hope and pray that things will get better because when we marched in the 60s, I knew that everything would be all right. I thought that everything would be all right. So now I'm, I'm reliving the past every day and I am so hurt, but I still will continue to speak out and I hope that everyone else will do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Shelby. Um, Joyce Norwood. Okay, there you go, Joyce. I was going to say the times that I have felt racism is actually when I have gone in the stores. And very much like Reggie was um, saying, when the guards follow you around, and they're not very subtle, at least I didn't think they were, because you could always tell. And I remember that um, my brother-in-law and his wife were visiting from out of town. And so we decided to go to Fashion Island, just hang out and walk around the mall. And so my sister-in-law wanted to go into a jewelry store that was there. And so we walked in. Now, Prior to our going into the store, there was a guard on the outside, just, I guess, shooting the breeze. And there were other people in the jewelry store. But as soon as my sister-in-law and I walked into the jewelry store, the guard turned around and followed us into the store. My brother-in-law then came in and walked up to him and said, there are other people in the store. Why did you go in when they came back, when they walked into the store? And he had nothing to say about that. Um, but other times you can just sense or feel that people are watching you when you go into the store. And so you know that they either think you shouldn't be there, you can't afford to be there, or um, um, you're gonna do something you shouldn't be doing. So that was one incident. One other incident, um, very briefly, is um, I had done some volunteer work at one of the universities on a cancer center board. And um, because of my work there and knowing some people, I had been invited to sit in on another board that dealt with, uh, with cancer and it was raising, and it was preparing for a fundraiser. So at the first meeting when I went there, um, there were about 10 of us, I think, and I didn't know anyone, but we introduced ourselves and one of the participants said something to me. I can't remember her exact words now, but clearly she was questioning uh, why I was there. So I asked her to clarify her question and I was gonna say some more to that, but then the moderator stepped in and she just kind of changed the subject. And um, after the meeting, I left and I never went back, but I was always very upset and angry with myself because I should have stayed there and pushed the issue to actually confront her in that meeting. Um, but I didn't and I was very upset about that. And I still think about it. But those were my two incidents here in Southern California. Thank you, Joyce. I, I feel the heaviness of the experiences and I could add my own to it. Um, if you give me 10 seconds, I can tell you the one that outside of the Charleston massacre, you know that was a stinker for the country. Um, and my best friend, well, good friend in college, um, 
was killed in that Charleston 9. But when my daughter entered TK, first day of TK, our daughter, Reggie and I, first day of TK, she's four years old. She comes bounding out of the school. We get in the car and she explains to me that she cannot play with Liliana for the school year. And I'm like, why can't you play with Liliana? And she said, well, Liliana told me my skin was black and that she could not play with me. I was deeply disturbed. And I thought, do I have to have the talk with a four-year-old? I mean, I'm equipped to teach her. And I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do everything I can to prevent her from having to go through senses and feelings of unworthiness because I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to feel, to feel like you have to go not only above and beyond, that it doesn't even matter. You're not articulate enough. You're not theological enough. You didn't go to the right seminary. You did not. And so when I heard my four-year-old say to me, I knew that there has to be a change because I just didn't and don't want her to experience the level of disregard, prejudice, racist <laughs> regard, microaggression that I've had to go through. But unfortunately, I am equipping her for the reality of what we have to face. I want to thank you all for sharing and you were heard. I believe that you were heard. So we have a second question that we open up and we're asking people that people think about their responsibility in addressing racism and systemic anti-black violence. We would like to open this question up first to non-black identifying participants and then to all participants. Um, what is your responsibility? I'll ask the question again. It may go up on the screen. What is your responsibility to address systemic anti-Black violence? And what is one specific action that you could take to help interrupt racism? I will look for hands raised. And Bettina, if you can help with that. Okay, so we have, um, in addition to my dog, Kaylee, who obviously wants to speak, <laughs> um, we have Donna Duran. Can you, am I on? Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, it's actually Alex. I'm just Alex. sitting with Donna. Um, it's something that Carol mentioned earlier, where she said um, sometimes she felt like it was her responsibility to um, conduct herself in a all. And I think I've been guilty of sometimes saying, well, you know what, I've seen that, I've heard that, but I don't do it, so that's fine. I could just, this doesn't apply to me. But that's not true. I need to take a more active role in out and, um, and things like that. So some of the things I've already done is um, through my workplace, sometimes I'm told um, don't hire blacks, they're, they're lazy, don't hire, um, things like that. I never followed those rules, but now instead of just ignoring it and doing what I'm gonna do anyway and hire whoever I feel is best for the job, it's more important to speak truth to power, even if it's the boss, even if it's the president of the company, that those comments aren't okay. And just take more of a stand 
and not be so timid and so selfish and just understand that I have a responsibility for all, not just my own self-interest. I just wanted to share that. And I really appreciate hearing everyone's comments. They're, they're really hitting home. So thank you for all for sharing. Thank you, Alex. Um, we have uh, Mark Davis. Reverend Mark. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn that step past tolerance which sounds so condescending. Um, and the step past not being a racist into being anti-racist. Trying to learn appropriate places where I can lift my voice to, to instruct to encourage and to challenge. Um, and I'm trying to learn, uh, trying to take the steps here at home and in my work. Um, of really doing an internal audit on those lingering prejudices, many of which I learned in Hampton, Virginia, uh, at Shelby's Woolworth, mm. and, um, and many of which I picked up all on my own. And it's, it's become my real spiritual discipline to understand what it means to be anti-racist and to take that as, as my work. That's all. Thank you, um, Mark. Uh, Chris Mears. Um, am I on now, Janetta? <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, you're on. Thank you, and uh, thank you to my uh, brother Mark Davis uh, for his wonderful remarks, um, and also for Alex. Um, I didn't really uh, want to speak this evening, but then when you invited non-African people to speak, I was afraid that no one would speak up, so I volunteered. Uh, I've been in an interracial uh, marriage. Uh, for 10 years. In fact, this Friday is 10 years. Happy anniversary, Michelle. Mm -hmm. And I've worshiped in the Black church for almost 20 years. And I find that I know uh, less today than I did 20 years ago. Um, a couple of things, a couple of observations and thoughts. Um, white people need to stop being in denial that we are responsible for the last 400 years and we are responsible for the present uh, day expressions of racism uh, and the existence of institutional racism that uh, in some sense we have, which I was going to say in some sense we've benefited by, but I don't think we've, the cost has been so high to everyone and has been so high to, to the heart and the spirit and the soul of white people that no one has benefited by it, but there has certainly been economic benefit. And I take no issue with those who cite to that. Uh, and the economic, um, how integral African American people have been to the development of the economy in our country. But white people are very quick to say, among other things, uh, that they don't discriminate against anybody. Um, they're not responsible for slavery. They're not responsible for Jim Crow. They're not responsible for segregation. 
Um, and uh, we all just need to get along and move on from here. Um, it's just a shirking of responsibility. And so white people, myself included, uh, need to approach this subject, this broad subject, with a sense of profound and real responsibility because racism exists because of us. Institutional racism exists because of us. Um, one thing that I think that, that we all can and should do is seize the moment that we have to do what many people throughout the country are doing and it's part of the defunding movement uh, that uh, is gaining momentum. And we need to encourage on a local level our city councils and our county governments to um, defund, I guess is the shorthand uh, word for it, but we need to um, begin to re-examine and reform the extent to which we rely on our police agencies to do the work of our society. Um, because there's so much of it they do poorly. And there's so much of it they do with insensitivity and violence uh, and callousness. Uh, there, is, there is nothing that a couple of hundred people can't achieve who go down to their local city council and fill a chamber and demand change. And so I would encourage those who are so inclined to go down to your city council, speak in public comment, demand change within the police uh, agency that governs your city. Uh, and then I would also finally encourage uh, all of the African or all of the white people in the audience if you're not already attending a multiracial church or a black church, uh, go and attend a black church. I have one in mind, by the way, uh, but there are others. Uh, but uh, come and see us at New Hope. Uh, come and, and engage with us at New Hope. You'll be glad that you did. Thank, thank you, Chris. Um, Anne Sibley. Hey, right now is something that we need to do a whole lot more of. <clears throat> People are so afraid to sit and talk and find out something about the other people. I mean, I found out things. I've, I've loved African Americans all my life and had really good friends, but I've never had a conversation like this before. And I think that in our denial, white people, in our denial of, of what's going on, that we need to stop and really take a look at ourselves and think about the behavior that we have. I tend to be a person who likes to observe behavior and, um, and watch and see what people do and try all this to treat people with respect. But when I was a high school senior and I graduated, I grew up in Texas at an all white school and I left in 1960 when there was the uh, integration and it began the white flight out to the suburbs. I moved to West Virginia where it was, there were African Americans there and I had good friends there. But I came back home to Texas on the bus and what I saw on the bus, I, it, it was despicable to me. And so I purposely sat in the back and I talked to people because I thought it was unfair. I took someone into the restaurant with me to order food they would serve me, but they wouldn't serve the person that came in with me. So they didn't serve either one of us. So I was very incensed at, at age 17 uh, of what was going on in the world. And, and I think that the, the talks that we're having now are, are really showing the reality of it. And I think that as individuals, when we see things that you've had to go through, uh, and we see that it's not right. I think we need to be, be feel free enough to speak up and say, hey, that person didn't deserve that. That's not right. And we need to put a stop to it. Um, I agree with everybody said all, all along too, but I think we have to start taking the responsibility of standing up. And I myself as a teacher, I remember I had a color chart uh, I taught in a socially uh, ec ec disadvantaged economic area and I had a color chart and my last color was black. I, I had no idea. And one of the African-American fathers came in one day and he said, would you do me a favor, please, and ch ch change that color? 
And all of a sudden it hit me and I said, I am so sorry. It didn't even occur to me. So I think a lot of things that we do, the behavior that we have, we don't even know we're doing it. So that's what I would do. Thank you, Ann. Mm -hmm. Dot Leach. Hi, I am the founder of uh, Women Drivers Interfaith Group here in South County. And we are Christian, we are Muslim, we are Jewish, we are Baha'i, we are anything, uh, we are some without any faith. At our last meeting, we actually approached, and I say approached because you can only scratch the surface when you're introducing a topic, but it was based upon uh, an article uh, that was written that was titled Diversity and Expanding Diversity and Inclusivity. And we had a conversation, not a lecture, but a conversation with one another, just like this in our Zoom format. It was an important moment for some of these women. I say that that I am founder of that group. More importantly, I am the mother of James Cameron Leach. My son is a man of color. I have been privileged to be his mother since he was four weeks old, and we received him into our family. Some of the stories that you have shared tonight ring very true in my ear. Through the grace and graciousness of some African-American friends, I was told, you need to have a talk with him. And here's what you're gonna say to him. Because I didn't know. I didn't know, my white privilege never had me cross uh, the path of, of having to deal with the police officers and where to keep your hands and what to do and what to tell your son. It just wasn't part of my makeup. That young man is now the father of a five and a, five and a half month old daughter. And she is absolutely gorgeous. Her mother is from Somalia. I have two other grandchildren. They're blonde and blue eyed. My darling Sharahan is not. She is gorgeous. She has the biggest brown eyes and some killer dimples. And she is going to this world on. I can tell right now, even at five and a half months, and I want to be her biggest cheerleader. So what I'm doing is, while I can reach out with my women drivers and interfaith group and do things like we did this last week, what I'm doing is I need to start at home. So my grandchildren are staying with me this summer. And I have ordered books for them, age appropriate, nine and 12. And we're going to read books and we're going to read the stories of black leaders and we're going to read the stories about anti-racism and we're going to discuss it at the dinner table and that's how we're going to expand diversity and inclusivity in our family. Thank you so much. Lindsay Korth. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share what's on my heart. Um, it feels like a big thing, kind of a scary thing <laughs> to be so vulnerable and yet I feel supported in a safe space. Um, what comes to mind for me is I'm a social worker and I've dedicated my life to serving others, to loving them, to empowering others. Um, and I'm also a Christian and I feel like that's my God's calling for my life. And yet, even in the midst of that, I have my own prejudices and my privilege. And I feel like I'm getting woke with the violence that has happened recently and just seeing things in a new light. And 
I've really had to work to help my families talk about what's happening. I work for LA County Mental Health as a children's therapist with kids who are in foster care and adoptive homes, a lot of families that are multiracial families, um, as well as just me um, coming in as, as a white person working with families of color and that automatically sets up a different dynamic and creating, you know, I have to work hard to build rapport for people to feel safe to talk to me about these really um, painful issues and trauma and things that they have experienced, cultural trauma, historical trauma. And I really feel like there's a space for that healing to happen for families. And so I'm just working my faith through and like, how can I help parents talk to their kids about racism and how to facilitate change within their family, within their community. And then I'm coming home at night and I'm having to deal with my own stuff and just becoming more aware of people in my office code switching when I'm walking by and those microaggressions and those things that are so automatic that I have been trained up in and it's not things that I would ever want to do. But my heart is breaking to see more clearly like, wow, these are ways of interacting with people that are not how I would wish to treat someone. I want to love them completely as they are as a child of God to celebrate who they are. And yet I am wrestling with how to do that in a way that's genuine and where I can come alongside and share a story like we are and really hear like, what happened to you? What, what, what is life like for you now? And how can I come alongside and join with you? I'm not going to white explain. I'm not going to come in and be like, oh, I have the answer. Or, you know, I have an idea, right, of what, what should change. I don't know because I haven't lived it. But I want to be a part of speaking out against uh, the systems that uh, politically have been put in place that are oppressive and to use the avenues that I have to advocate for change. So I, I went to my first Black Lives Matter protest over the weekend. It was very powerful. Um, I've done some protesting, but not a lot, but it was a very different feel to share in that experience. And I plan to continue that advocacy. And I just thank you for the time. And I want you to know that every night I light a candle before I go to bed to pray for everyone who is going through this time. So I'm holding you in my heart and my prayers. God bless you and thank you. Susan Eaton. Okay. Um, what I, I'm conflicted too, but I, I grew up in a, a K-8 school, which was all white. And um, I didn't have any experience with blacks at all. And in the 40s and 50s, and um, my mother though told me one time when I was a child, don't ever use the N word because there might be a, I'm sure she said Negro, or colored person behind you that will stab you. And um, that's, you know, I, I still can't say it today, to tell you the truth. But um, I went to high school at a, a completely integrated high school. It wasn't integrated on purpose. It was just because it drew from black and white all over town. Um, in fact, if you saw the Hoosiers movie, we really did win um, the final thing there. But anyway, I w had gym, you know, just normal gym. But in gym class, we had a dancing area. And the dance, the girls, the black girls, when we could just talk, were really friendly and really vivacious and and they they taught me how to dance and um i saw my mother had been afraid of me going to that school but i went home and i'm like saying oh my god Mom, these black girls are so much fun 
you know, and we were dancing and, and laughing and uh, she didn't say anything, but it had, and, and my boyfriend ended up being my first husband, he uh, played football. And my whole goal in life was to be Mrs. Borges, his wife. And when I was in high school and there was one of his big lineman um, football players who every time he met me in the hall, he'd say, hi, Miss Bulges. And, and I thought that was funny the way he said it. And then in college, I turned into a speech therapist and learned that he was just saying black language. Anyway, so I had, I had very, I changed completely. But uh, so I have a motto that, that familiarity breeds understanding. And that doesn't mean that I don't feel a little uh, systemic racism though also when I meet somebody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Chie Chap. Yai. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Okay. Thank you so much for hosting us and inviting us uh, here this evening. I believe the question was around what we can be doing um, as allies. And um, I'm so excited that I'm reading a book right now uh, called How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Um, and want to give a shout out to my sister who's also attending this vigil who uh, introduced me to this book. Um, and as I understand it, being anti-racist means not merely being a silent ally, but taking action um, to help change um, to policy that promotes racial equity in our society, which is so um, deeply not happening <laughs> and has not been happening for so long. And it's uh, overwhelming to me as an Asian who uh, is reluctant to be involved in uh, politics, uh, but I am looking for ways to um, help support uh, monetarily supporting organizations that are uh, making headways for change um, for our black community and for our communities of color um, by educating myself. Uh, and again, by looking for ways that I can help to make a change with systemic change. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Reverend Tom Kramer. Well, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Is it she or, well, I guess I'll find out she's muted now. I think, uh, I think I resonate with so many of her comments that it's so different than also the comments that I've heard tonight. It's so different being an anti-racist than just defending yourself from claims that you're racist somehow. And so, you know, the training that we experience from even forums like this, but any training that we can receive right now by reading books like How to Be an Anti-Racist. I work in a presbytery, you know, and we're all, every organization, we all belong to organizations. They're on a spectrum of either being racist, of course, they would never call themselves that, to anti-racist. And so really understanding what it looks like to be anti-racist in that type of group and that type of family. And I just think uh, there's been enough talk and this is a call to action. And what um, my sister before me said is it's time to give, uh, you know, there's nothing normal about being white you know, it took 400 years to get us to where we are and the destructiveness of whiteness uh, to learn all these things, whether we just drink it from the water we swim in. But it's going to take a, an enormous force to 
be cleansed and um, to heal. So I just resonate with a lot of what's been said. Um, I don't know why I haven't monetarily given to organizations before or black politicians before. I mean, that seems so simple. And Mark Davis sent us an article, article by Chad Sanders uh, this week. And, you know, it says, I don't need love texts from my white friends. I need them to fight anti-blackness -black in the New York Times. And so I just feel like uh, it's time for me to give money, give my time, and be a person of action rather than just talking a lot. And uh, talking's good, but I, I got to find ways to actually translate that. And I, um, so I resonate with a lot of, of what's been said tonight. And I so thank you for your leadership, the initiative that you've taken to get us together tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We have two more people, Stephanie Garcia and then Sue Jean Cole Parsons. So um, Stephanie Garcia. Hello. Um, so some things I kind of wanted to say when it comes to how can you stand up and not be a racist and not do racist tendencies and kind of be an advocate. Um, I have always considered myself kind of sheltered when it comes to a lot of racist ideals, a lot of racist, you know, actions around me. Um, I just kind of lived in a bubble where I thought everyone was treated the same and no one judged people by the color of their skin because that's what you learn in grade school. And so to be doing anything otherwise is, you know, absurd and, um, I kind of floated through life thinking that everyone was treated equally. And unfortunately, the reality is, as you know, as I've gotten older and kind of, um, you know, started looking at everything and started, of, you know, being instead of a passive observer, more of like an active participant and, you know, allowing people who have, um, been subjugated to um, racism and systemic racism and been subjugated to police brutality and all these negative things that have happened instead of just, wow, that's a one-time event. Oh, that will never happen again. And just seeing it happen over and over and over again. And the same you know, thing, just no change, no action. And if there is action, it's one or two steps and forward and seven steps back or just the progress not being made to justify these actions. Um, tactics I use to try and, you know, finally have a voice and try and do something and stand up for this is that I've just tried to like bury myself in research and try and find people that are just, you know, begging for people to hear them that are begging for someone to listen and just stop talking and listen and just to hear what they have to say, what, you know, changes they wish they could be done. And I've gone to protests for other things, but never racism, because I didn't think racism was a problem, and just finding how ingrained it is in our society, and fighting back, and it's just so crazy just to let all these people who, you know, wish they had a voice, allow them to speak and listen, and so one of the things I would always advocate for is that listen and <laughs> just just open your ears close your mouth and listen to people talk let them say what they have to say especially if they're people of color like they've had years of injustice and no one listening just let them speak and let them you know express themselves and more importantly don't stop speaking about injustices. Um, I've on Facebook become a huge advocate and this is how I found this group was I was looking for something to um, you know do and some action behind it and I wanted um, something to just allow for people to spot, uh, speak about injustices and as an ally and as a white person I'll never understand completely but I can allow people who do understand to speak so my advice for other people who would like to be an ally is just listen and listen with pure intent thank you thank you so much um, Sue Cole Parsons um. It's Sujin, um, but I'm sorry. <laughs> oh no, it's okay. Um, people have 
difficulty with my name all the time, but so you're not alone. But I just wanted to thank uh, New Hope um, for creating this space and for inviting St. Mark into it um, um, to give us this opportunity to um, just share and lament um, and to give us the opportunity to listen to um, our black sisters and brothers. Um, so in my own um, work, I, I, um, I write about and I think about um, theology, Christian theology, and um, I think a lot about how um, it's entangled with anti-Blackness. And so um, I have been trying to teach um, and think through those connections um, to various communities, college students, um, also Asian American Christians. Um, and so I am going to be continuing in that work, but I'm also um, feeling more clarity about how this needs to also be connected to my local context. And so, um, and how the political is theological and how the theological is political. And so I, um, I'm really hoping to sort of ground my thinking into action and sort of interrogating how systems of whiteness often are aligned with um, Christian complicity. And so um, that's what I hope to do. Thank you so much. We do have, I, I do see, I think Bettina is telling me there was one other person that uh, had raised their hand quite early and that is um, Jonah Knight. So we wanna acknowledge Jonah. We're, we're running over, so Jonah will have to be the last one, but prayerfully this won't be the last time we come together, um, Jonah. Okay, can you hear me and see me? Yes. So um, I just want to very quickly say that um, being Black in America is, um, for lack of a better term, is to be um, unique. And it's a beautiful thing. I, too, grew up in Portsmouth, Virginia. So we had a, you know, a sense of pride and a sense of grounding, you know, being Black um, in Virginia and in Chicago. But another thing that I believe being Black in America is we have had to carry a burden. We have had to, had to carry a load. We've had to carry a load of being Black and being under the system of, for 400 years, the system of slavery and oppression and all of that. And we also, from what I've heard from the earlier conversations from my black brothers and sisters, we've had to carry the burden also of making others feel comfortable, making ourselves or trying to make ourselves fit in. I think right now in this moment, we have to allow ourselves to lift that burden now and free ourselves from having to feel like that we have to fit in a certain box so that we can make other people comfortable with us. We are perfect in who we are as being born black. So we can be free now and, it, and it's systemic and it's um, been ingrained in us, you know, to look at ourselves a certain way and for others to look at us a certain way. But something has happened in the last two weeks and I am hopeful that um you know this is a changing point from us it's kind of peculiar peculiar that mr floyd caused this but i believe that was his purpose because there's been thousands of other mr floyds but it's not just incumbent one of the things that will help us lighten our burden and our load that we have had to carry in America is to understand that it's not incumbent upon us to go to other white people who don't understand or who refuse to understand. It's not incumbent upon us to go to them and say, can you look at me as a person? Can you accept me as an equal? They have to come to the table. There has to be white people that like you on the phone call that will go back to your churches, that will go back to your churches, that will have those
those difficult conversations with other white people to kind of get their minds open as to the privilege they had and enjoyed over the last 400 years and to open their minds so that, you know, it's so that we don't walk away saying, okay, this is just another incident. So we have, as black people, have to let, let those burdens go. We don't have to fit into any, anybody's criteria. We can be the beautiful people that we are. And then also, everybody who's on this call, if you want to make a difference, go out into your communities, not just your families, to your workplace, to your communities, and to your churches, and have these conversations so that we can make effective change. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Jonah. I want to thank everyone who has participated. It, it definitely gives me hope. I invite you to um, know that this vigil is um, just a part of the ongoing mission of New Hope Presbyterian Church um, and our social justice ministry team. Uh, we have multiple ongoing activities that center on racial justice um, in the works. And to continue the journey with us and find out more information, please join us for our virtual worship, which is on Saturdays at five o'clock. And I invite you to follow the church and the social justice ministry on social ministry. We will begin um, very soon a um, online book study on my grandmother's hands, which really focuses on the psychological and spiritual trauma of racial injustice. And that trauma, it, it extends beyond just the black community. In some ways, we're all traumatized and we need to, to identify the trauma that we face and maybe it will help us to grow in healing. Um, do we have any announcements from St. Mark? I just wanted to share that uh, those of us from St. Mark who are on this call are very humbled by this opportunity to, share, to stand in solidarity and pain with you, our friend, New Hope. Uh, Janetta, thank you so much for your invitation. With the call to do justice ever before us, we are exploring the depth to which racism is systemic in our culture, in our language, and even our church. Uh, Three of the other, two of the other folks on this call are part of a three-person team where we're working on bringing a panel together uh, to not only explore the issues related to the Black Lives Matter movement that is fomenting among us, um, but to embrace how it is that different generations are looking at the moment before us and um, and we're promoting a book study by uh, Ibrahim X. Kendi on how to be anti-racist. So we're trying to live into this reality as well. Thank you so much. I invite you each to hold your candle as we, and as we close out in prayer, you can stay on longer um, because we do have information that will silently follow us. And you can read that information if you, if you so desire. Uh, we won't be going anywhere. And change is what we're having right now. I have to say, I, I heard one pastor say, I was really disappointed that um, all of this will blow over soon enough and we'll get back to our regular norm. And I said, are you speaking of the pandemic? And he said, no, I'm speaking of this racial thing right now. And it can't blow over because we all have our part to play in lighting a new kind of light and hearing one another. And as a black person, I, I'm not gonna go into another speech, so I'm five seconds on this. I just simply think that we need the opportunity to bring voice to the depth of a pain that may be difficult to understand. And so I'm appreciative for this opportunity tonight to do such a thing. It, it, it begins to bring healing. So let us pray. Merciful God, continue to bring the light of hope and the light of insight, the light of wisdom and listening and faith 
into our every experience, into the depths of our souls. Make us bold in our witness to the point that we will cry out and we will speak against racial disregard, racial prejudice, indifference, jokes. I pray, Lord, that you will give us a non-fearing presence that we will stand in solidarity with one another. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you all. Good night. And I pray that we will get back together soon. You may remain on the line to watch our ending if you'd like.